you won't just learn the safety skills, you don't just learn the medical skills, but you learn about the team dynamic, you learn about the individuals, you learn that psychological component about how people respond or react, and it kind of really beds the team together as well. And it. Hello, my name is Sasha Dench, but I'm better known as the human swan. I'm also the UN's ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species. This year, the charity I founded, Conservation Without Borders, is launching a new expedition to follow the flight of the osprey, an epic migration of 10,000 kilometers through 14 countries from Europe to West Africa. As a part of this, we're doing a series of podcasts to highlight the global stories and connections this bird makes to help us see our complex and challenged world through the eyes of this incredible animal. In this episode, I speak to Alastair Hollington about preparing for the worst on migration, but not for birds this time, for humans, the humans in my team, and how we came up with the sometimes shocking scenarios we put them through in preparation for this expedition. Thank you very much for um, joining us from, is it Essex you're at at the moment? No, I'm over in Bristol. We're doing Bristol. some medical training for some media workers that are deploying all around the world. Excellent. Um, yeah, and I'm in a yeah, little village in northern Spain. Um, but yeah, really wanted to catch up with you because I guess we're already we've been on the road for um, for a month now. But the um, the start of the expeditions, having the the training with you was was really good. And it's come up in conversation on various occasions. So I thought the best thing was for us to do an interview with you and capture the essence of it and uh, why it's really useful, particularly for those who are asking me about it. It's better that it comes from the horse's mouth. Um, So yeah, at the start, um, can you give us a broad summary of what it is that Lazarus do? Okay, well, thank you. So Lazarus Training is a safety training organization, uh, predominantly based in the UK, though we have a, a branch in Dublin as well. And what we do is we try and help prepare people for their worst day, essentially. And so through training people in advance, through medical and safety skills, we hope that they can either prevent bad things happening or respond better um, uh, rather than reacting to events that occur. There's this kind of concept that in times of of trouble, of a bad incident perhaps, is that people rise to the moment. Whereas actually what tends to happen is we all drop down to the kind of lowest form of ourselves, And that's where training before you go on an expedition gives you that baseline, a, a set of things that you can do that are pre-programmed. And I think most people genuinely believe what you just said, that you rise to the moment, but I have really seen it, particularly actually in the first training I ever did with you, uh, where we had one person in the, in the team who was, I think, the most on paper, the most trained in terms of all things medical. I don't know if you remember this incident, um, but nobody was prepared for what, well, nobody had been told exactly what was coming. And at the first incident that looked quite real, um, because of the prosthetics and the way that you set it up. Uh, yeah, the first sight of lots of blood, uh, this person put up their hands and just said, bleeding, 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 and uh, mm-hmm. left the person who was their, their partner, who had very little medical training at all, to get stuck in and have a go at it. Um, so it is, yeah, I guess that was, for me, it was a, a moment to really see that actually you aren't your best self necessarily when the worst happens. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the, the, it's really good when an expedition or a group of people takes that time in advance. And it's difficult in the run up to an expedition because there's so much going on, but it can be time very well spent putting together a plan of spending time together. So you get to know each other as individuals, people's strengths and where maybe they're not so strong, but it's also kind of, it helps work out, yeah, where, who's good at this, who's bad at this and how are people going to respond? Because we don't know until we're put into that situation. And it's much better to do it in a safe learning environment than when it's actually for real. And do you remember the first hearing about the Flight of the Swans expedition when, uh, when we got in touch uh, a few years ago? Um, and obviously we've gone on now to do further expeditions in that, uh, in that vein. Uh, do you remember hearing about it, what your first reaction was? Yeah, I definitely do, because the, the route that we kind of all met up was through the media remote locations, medical training that we do. And somebody that had been through that was involved in our expedition. The reason that we're all kind of happy to kind of then help is that, if you pardon the pun, as a medical training organisation, we like to think we have a heart and we like to connect with good causes and we support local rugby teams through sponsorship and stuff like that. 
but we're, we're very keen to kind of be involved in conservation and environmental issues. Part of kind of a community is, is protecting it for the next generation and so on. And so when we were asked about could we support by providing some first aid training in that case for flight of the swans, we were glad to. We try and carve a little bit of time out each year and allocate some resources to, to similar things, whether it's being a speaker at a, a conference or, or providing training to an expedition. Um, so for the, for the Flight of the Swans uh, expedition, we didn't have a kind of standard package. It was, we basically had looked at all the different countries we were going through. And obviously the Russian Arctic was a, was a big thing um, and worked with you to figure out what the course content um, would be like. What exactly does that process look like for you? Well, it's, it's a very much a collaborative thing is that we have some set ideas of things that we want to cover with people, but you've got to put it into the context of the expedition or the group that you're working with. So, for example, bleeding. Um, there's an argument that we all bleed the same wherever we are, but in fact, working somewhere very cold changes the chemistry of your blood. So we have to kind of look at it slightly differently. And then what would make the person bleed? So on Flight of the Swans, I remember, if my, well, if my memory serves me correct, we were worried about firearms, people having guns, so that might be the cause of bleeding. I and mean, there was also concern about attacks from wild animals. And if you're doing an expedition in like kind of Russia and Northwest Europe, those animals are going to be different from if you're doing one in West Africa, for example. Yeah, I mean, we had polar bears were a, were a genuine uh, risk. Mm. And for insurance purposes, we actually had to show that we were managing all the different risks. And when it comes to polar bears, like what can you really do apart from a, have a bear scarer on you, and B, uh, be prepared to treat somebody if such an incident happened. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, most, many animal-human interactions, obviously the animal just disappears off and so on. But you have to be prepared to kind of deal with the worst case scenario and sort of the injuries someone would receive from a polar bear, as has been known from tragic events on school expeditions in the past and stuff, is they could be catastrophic. So you have to sort of train for the worst so then everything else is easy. But you can't then pick that up, that scenario, for the team going through that sort of Russian area to then try and use it again for a team going through West Africa. So for your current expedition, we obviously had to review the, the risks and concerns for the group. Yeah, and for that, it was quite different. I mean, the other, the other um, sessions that I remember, particularly for the Flight of Swans expedition, because it was such a long road journey for a lot of people, not for me, uh, but was dealing with car accidents. Yeah, now that is one thing that is not universal, but is common. And it's one of these things that affects everybody around the world. Um, and the reasons for road traffic deaths are complex, whether it is the roads, whether it's the vehicles, the lack of maintenance, the lack of driving standards, or the distance from medical responses. But it does affect us everywhere. So that is probably one of the bits of training that is centerpiece in much of what we do, whether it is a full hostile environments course. Uh, we're back in Ukraine very shortly, and it'll be covered on those sort of courses or for expeditions traveling across the world. And so if we look at the Flight of the Osprey expedition now, when we first started talking about that, we realized actually the assessment of what kind of training we should have was a bit different. Yeah, if you look at kind of expeditions or people traveling through the kind of Western Africa, and this is true in many places, but not to be honest with you, but as people from outside that community going into the community, you are faced with different risks. And when we looked at the risk historically, there's been... Uh, Crime has been a problem expeditions have faced. Violence has been problems expeditions have faced. They may come across like law enforcement, military, pseudo-military organisations running checkpoints. So we had to sort of yeah, go a down of, a, a couple of the countries have had, have had reasonably regular military coups as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we had to kind of do a bit of a more of a blend of taking topics from what you traditionally call hostile environments awareness training, but then put it into the bespoke package for yourselves. And there was another thing that I had I'd noticed from the previous expeditions that there is another element when you're going on an expedition where you're going through sometimes well, challenging environments, but also you're regularly meeting communities that you don't know. So you're having sort of first time interactions with people and your main aim is to learn from them, to speak to them. 
and you want to absorb all sorts of information and some will be information you are that you want to hear um, and some will be information some people in the team really won't want to hear mm. um, for example people's opinions on you know killing certain animals how they might be killing them etc when um, what I realized from uh, previous expeditions was that sort of information was really important for us to get it in order to know to understand the kind of culture and approach and how you could influence things in future Whereas it was very easy in those sort of scenarios to instead instantly react to hearing something like that and want to give your opinion or change things or be offended. And that can lead to a not very effective interactions, but it can also put you backwards in terms of what you you want to to um, achieve with conservation. You're better off just absorbing information rather than trying to change stuff there and then. Um, so, yeah, it was amazing that you were interested in trying to incorporate some of that into the training as well. Yeah, we refer to it as being about responding to things rather than reacting to them. And it's something of a more sort of psychological content. And obviously, you've got people you can speak to about that, um, about the content we covered with you. But yeah, if someone's saying something that's offensive to you and upsetting to you, then it's very easy to kind of react to that from your kind of gut emotions. And, and that is rarely going to work well. It's going to then upset the other people. And the communication then is very, very difficult. And as with many parts of life, communication is key. So, yeah, letting people in that say safe learning environment, explore the topics, see if they've got a pre-programmed reaction, uh, something you might call like triggers, for example, something that's going to upset them very, very quickly, and then allowing them to practice and develop tools so that they can respond rather than react is, is kind of good value. Mm. So can you can you give us a bit of detail on maybe an element or a couple of elements of the training we went through? So if someone was in classroom, much of it was outside, um, but some potentially where you incorporated a bit of the the psychological challenge along with a difficult kind of physical scenario. OK, yeah. So the, the, these things come together on quite a few of them. So um, I could probably give you several examples, but. The idea, again, is back to that rising to the moment versus dropping to the so our natural levels and so on. And so it's quite easy to bring in a sort of psychological component when you've got a live role player that's begging with you to help them and whimpering and crying as you're trying to help them. That kind of really puts that pressure on and allows people to kind of practice their response and kind of really focus in on what they're doing. Conversely, we also, with your group, looked at going through checkpoints, whether they've been running by police officers or by militias, depending on where in the world you may be. And people find that quite difficult. You normally have quite self-selecting individuals go on expeditions, they've picked to do this, they're used to making informed decisions, they're used to being in charge of things that they do. And when you come up against a checkpoint where maybe the person at the checkpoint's got a gun, maybe they've been drinking, maybe they're tired, whatever, it's quite maybe, maybe difficult it's not to an surrender that maybe it's not. Maybe it's not an official checkpoint. It might yeah, just absolutely. be somebody um, stopping uh, people on the side of the road and yeah yeah it could be that it could just be yeah someone there with a machete and a bit of wood across the road or whatever it may be and a lot of people find it very difficult to then surrender the agency and sort of say i'm no longer in charge of this and that's why we go through it and sort of say to them well the person with the weapons has got more authority than you have in this situation but can we kind of work with them can we manipulate them a little bit and so on but to suppress that urge to sort of say no i'm in charge you can't do this and so on so I guess that's the kind of, again, working on the psychological response rather than reaction as well. And uh, yeah, and I think that was that was really useful also for the team members, again, as with the yeah. medical scenarios to see how different people respond. And um, and there was some apart from people, you know, having, um, I guess, threatening behavior towards them mm. and people with weapons, which was part of the scenario, yeah. um, also to have uh not all verbal abuse but certainly quite a pretty offensive things said um you could still see although it was a scenario people buy into your scenarios uh, which is well i can be quite <laughs> offensive when i need to be yeah you but, can but i've it, seen that now but yeah, so can yeah, also but, members of the team when you when you put yeah. them in the role of being uh, the offender um it is, some, some of them the slip a little too comfortably into that role well that's one of the that's one of the reasons we do that it's a really interesting point of view about sort of very kind of basic cod psychology and so on is that people do change and you could see that and we won't go into all the details of what we do on the exercise but where people are kind of given a little bit of authority they start to run with it and take it so again it helps you look at the people in your team it helps you broaden your idea of how people react around the world 
And again, it hopefully helps build that response rather than reaction to what's going on around you. I uh, am obviously a big fan of what you do and I found it really useful. Um, there are, uh, and I know that you ha do training for various companies that are sending people off overseas for mm. media purposes and for other purposes. Do you uh, get many requests from conservation organizations? Because I've been on quite a few conservation expeditions and haven't had this sort of training before. Mm. I would say, unfortunately, we don't. Um, and often that's linked into things like budgetary requirements, that it's difficult for organisations to fund it. But it can be money well spent if you get the kind of the, the proper training from it and so on. We've had like links in with us. Uh, we've been out to places and done some work to do with climate change and disaster response or post-disaster response and so on. But it is an area that doesn't seem to get access to the training as much as, for example, media workers who I'm working with today. Yeah. And like you said, you're working with people whose budgets are significantly bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if um, I guess uh, if we were making a case for it, how would how would you pitch that? Why why is it, why well, is it money well spent? Well, I mean, what price life, isn't it? Is that it's one of these things that you can't prove. If the training stops a disaster or something bad happening, you can't prove that negative that the the training saved the car accident happening and so on. But I would suggest that if it's done well and you really target and you speak to the provider and say, this is exactly what I need and have that negotiation with them, you won't just learn the safety skills. You don't just learn the medical skills, but you learn about the team dynamic. You learn about the individuals. You learn that psychological component about how people respond or react. And it kind of really beds the team together as well. And it's, it's an area that we've looked at working on in the future of using the training about building a team and looking at leadership and so on so i think if you look at it as a sort of one line on a on a proposal of oh it's first aid training or oh it's safety training you don't actually see the value behind the cost mm. yeah and like i said at the very beginning i i found it so useful in lots of different ways also just to see how people just to know how individuals respond um yeah. with, when they're faced uh with a with with the worst is quite different to how they can be as a whole team in ordinary in ordinary scenario so a person who i'd say is often a, a weak would, would be a, a weak leader if you just looked at them in a group um doing ordinary activities and yet everything goes horribly wrong there's a dreadful scenario and i've seen mm. uh someone relatively weak actually that would be the one who stays calm and level-headed and steps up um, but that is all critical information to know about your team. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's the kind of like the hidden part of, of these kind of training courses. And so particularly if you're able to, as a team leader, attend a training as well, you get this kind of extra granular level about the people that you're going on the expedition with. Mm -hmm. And expeditions are superb. There's like life-changing experience, things that will stay with you forever. But they're also, you're going to be tired at times. You're going to be hungry at times. You're going to have friction within the team where people don't get on with each other. And if the training's done well, you can sort of simulate that and explore that before you've even kind of set off. And it yeah. gives you a real good fundamental understanding of who you've got in your team and where their strengths are. Yeah. Like I said, Alistair, I'll let you get back to your training. You've got important right. stuff to do. And uh, yeah, thank you very much again for all your support so far. No, no, it's a pleasure to. The, kind of the work you're doing is essential and it's kind of, we're really enjoying watching the progress of the team as you go down and, and meet like-minded people and discuss the issues that Ospreys face and conservation yeah. faces.